This morning, I invite you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, and we're looking at uh, this topic of I serve over the uh, a five-week period. We're focused on that. Last week, we started talking about prayer, praying for others to be workers in the field, praying that God would provide sources and resources for people to come out and begin to share the gospel message with those around them. To be able to fill different ministry areas, that's very important. And hopefully you're praying, hopefully you're continuing to walk through that. And uh, we uh, had uh, sheets back in the foyer that you can pick up. There's still some there that can help guide you over the next four weeks to continue to pray about that. But one of the things we want to know is, you know, a lot of people that are Christians will come to me and they'll say, Preacher, I want to know what is my spiritual gift? What is it that God specifically wants me to do? I don't think people are sitting there going, I don't want to serve Jesus. They're just uncertain of how to serve Jesus. So one of the things I want to answer for you during this message is to walk through the process that says, hey, I want you at the end of this message to be able to know how to determine and understand what God's will for you, what God's gift for you is personally. Because you and I have natural inborn traits that we have. You and I also have skills and abilities that we've learned and we've grown through our life. But if you are a believer this morning, you also have a very specific gift that is a grace gift given to you by God. It's not a natural ability. It's not a skill you can learn. It's something you can improve, but you and I have that gift from God. So we want to see how that all fits. Well, in this morning's uh, reading, we want to go to Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy according to proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who has mercy or shows mercy with cheerfulness. Okay, we have gifts, so how am I going to find them out? The first thing I want us to think about is in order for me to discover the gift that God has given me, I need to pray. Now, last week we talked about the praying for others. Specifically, that was the the target of last week. But what I need you to do is I need you to this week think about that prayer needs to be focused on me also. I need to be open to hear what God has for me. I need to be open to hear where God is wanting to direct me in my life and what gift He has given to me and what He's doing with me. I need to be open to that. So I need to be praying. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the Lord's Prayer, what He's teaching us to do there is say, God, I want Your will to be done in my life. I want Your direction to be carried out in my life. I want You to have Your way in everything that's going on. So, if you and I want to know and discover what God's gift for us is, then we need to be open to say, God, I'm willing to do whatever. I'm willing to be whatever. I'm willing to use that gift and Let it make a difference in my family, in my life, and the life of others. I want to know how you you wired me. I want to know how you put me together so that I can understand and identify with that gift and begin to utilize that gift. We all have, as believers, a gift. And so we need to be open to hearing what God is saying. Secondly, once we've 
been praying about that gift. We've been asking God to reveal that to us. Then we're ready to begin to learn about the different gifts. They're in your sermon notes. And I want you to know, your sermon notes are there to help you not only go through the sermon while we're going through it right now, but your sermon notes are there to help you go home and be able to study. As a matter of fact, we don't ever go over all the passages that are in your sermon notes. And I encourage you to take the opportunity, go home, and read through those other passages. We read one passage on gifts as we looked at uh, earlier, the, the Romans passage. But also, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 8-10, through 10, it says, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now the passages I've given you to go home and look up and, and study, those passages, they, they go over 18 different spiritual gifts that God has for us. They're, they're gifts that deal with service, speaking, motivational gifts. There's all kinds of different gifts. Now, the 18 that it lists there, that's not all of them. That's not the only gifts in the Bible it talks about. So, But that is something to give you something to get started, to begin looking and saying, is this where I fit? Are these the things that's wanting to go on? So we have to be aware of what types of gifts does God give in order for us to recognize it? Because some of us, we have gifts that God has given us, and we don't even recognize them as gifts from God. We just kind of ignore them. Because we're not even in tune with God to the point where we're clear that that's what it is. That's why we need to pray. That's why we need to look at the Bible. We need to study the Bible. We need to look at what His Word has to say. We need to understand those gifts and be aware of them. Because some of you have gifts of speaking that are absolutely amazing. Now, you, you, well, sometimes when people hear the gifts of speaking, they automatically think, well, that's the preacher or the teacher. But you know what? One of the gifts of speaking that I think of is I've got a lady who constantly calls, constantly involves herself in my, our life, has for over 25 years been a part of our life, and on a regular basis encourages us. I mean, her words are just a tremendous encouragement to us. And, you know, there are times when she calls that you, you, may, not, you may not even feel like talking right then. But you pick up that phone and you start to talk with her. And by the time you put it on that phone, you're ready to go tackle the world. What a speaking gift of being able to speak encouragement into somebody else's life. I don't know what your gift is. I don't know what God is doing in your life. But you have a unique gift, either speaking or service or, or motivation or something, leadership, all different areas of giftedness that are there. And our, our giftedness is different than the people around us. Okay? The third thing I want us to think about is we need to inventory our gift mix. We need to know what is our gift mix. What, what is that? Now, one of the things I've put there in your notes, if you're using the electronic notes, then you've got a link there that you can go to, and you can immediately go to, that, uh, to the website that I'm indicating here in your printed notes that will give you the opportunity to print that off, fill it out, score yourself, begin to understand a little bit about the gift mix that you have. Now, if you're, if you're wanting to just look it up quickly on your computer or something, you can just look up lifeway.com, and then once you get there, type in spiritual gift inventory, and it will take you to where you can find this online. But I encourage each and every one of you to do this. Why? It's not going to answer every question for you. It's not intended to. But it's going to give you a beginning, an insight, a beginning work that can go on. And you can begin to say, well, this is, this is kind of the area my life is focused on. 
You see, the tendency is, is we begin to look around us and we begin to think of our life and the way we think of things, and we think everybody around us pretty much is close to that, especially here in the church. But in reality, it's so different. Recently, when we did this with our deacons, and I know some of the small group leaders have been doing this too, but recently when we did this with our deacons, you know, there's over 20 deacons gathered in a room. We've done these profiles. We begin to look at them on the board, and we realize, wow, I think the most of anybody that had, I mean, if you could say this person had the exact same gifts of this person as far as the same gift mix, it would have probably been three or fewer. But, I mean, there was one deacon that had the gift of hospitality. Wow. And some people will say, well, We'll work, him, we'll work him over. You know, we'll give him all kinds of responsibilities. But, you know, if you were to pull all of us together and each of us were to take that inventory, we would find that the person sitting to our right or the person sitting to our left are different. And that's okay. That's the body of Christ. That's the nature of who we are. God didn't make us to be all alike. Our deacons, if, we don't want all of our deacons to be all alike. We don't want all of our small group leaders to be all alike. We don't even want all of our small groups to be all alike. It's not about being like the person beside you or your leader or this, this standard. It's about being what God wants you to be, recognizing that and beginning to move forward to accomplish being what God wants you to do and be. So you and I need to inventory our gift mix and what you'll find is you'll have several of these areas you'll score fairly high in but there will be specific areas that are much higher or or very significant to you and you can you can look at that score it and and look at the uh, examples it gives and that will help you begin to understand your personal spiritual gifts the fourth thing I want you to understand is you need to listen to your heart now, some people will say, what do you mean, listen to my heart? Well, think about it. What are you passionate about? Now, so many times in my ministry, people have told me, well, you know, if you follow Jesus Christ and you tell him, I don't want to leave the country, first thing he's going to tell you to do is leave the country. If you follow Jesus Christ and you tell him, I'm terrified of teaching, the first thing he's going to make you do is teach. The, I have heard in my life the way God works is He figures out what your worst thing is and He pushes you off into that. Do you know what? Sometimes that's true. But one of the things I've always found from people that have had that type of experience is that they discovered that that was their place where they found the greatest joy. They were uncomfortable moving there at first, but once they got there, they found... That was their place of comfort and joy with God. But let me tell you what, that is not the norm. Look at what Psalm 37 verse 4 says. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Now does that sound like you hate something and God pushes you off in that direction? No. You see, what happens is, if you've been doing what we're talking about, if you're praying and you're asking God, God, show me what I'm supposed to be doing, then God is already placing in your heart and in your mind the things that you need to desire. And then He begins to, to place that on your, your mind, and you begin to be a little passionate about that. And you know what? Some of the people sitting right beside you are not passionate at all about the thing you're passionate about. Drives you crazy. Because you kind of go, this is important. They should, they should grab this. They should run with this. That's your gift mix. God's working with you. So he's going to use your passion to help lead you to become what he wants you to be. So listen to your heart. Listen to your passions. Now another thing... Listen to your dissatisfactions. Because if you're, if you're listening to your heart, yeah, you have passions, but you also have dissatisfactions. There's some people that will say something like this. 
I wish they had a Bible study class down there that taught something where I could hear it and understand it the way it really needs to be taught and understood. I wish they had a Bible study class that didn't spend 20 minutes talking about prayer concerns, but actually spent time in Bible study. I wish they had a class, and, and what we do sometimes is we throw that off and we say, I wish, and then we never do anything about it. The reality is you have everybody in every pew. We could go one by one by one. We could walk back through here and we could say, anybody on this road dissatisfied about anything in your life? And you know what we would find out? Even in the choir, every row would have people that are dissatisfied with something. What we need to understand is sometimes these dissatisfactions are the prompting of God to move us to become the solution to the issue that is causing so much problem for us. We have an issue that we're dealing with and we can't figure out how in the world everybody else doesn't see that so clearly. When in reality, if you were to poll the people sitting around me, or you, you would find they don't even, it's not even on their radar. We assume everybody else has the same understanding. Point. In seminary, I'm a member of a church that is running about 600. I'm there sitting, oh, about five or six rows back, the right-hand side of the pastor. The pastor in his sermon uses a word that I don't have a clue what it means. And it's a key word to what he's talking about that day. So, to my nature, I lean to the guy beside me and I say, do you know what that word means? And he goes, "Uh uh-uh. So I lean to this guy and go, do you know what that word means? He goes, "Uh uh-uh. I tap the person in front of me and I ask, do you know what that word means? And they're going, So I'm trying to gently lean back and tap the person behind me when the pastor says, Butch, do you have a problem? (laughs) I said, well, Brother Blair, you're using this word and I don't know what it means. He says, ask anybody around you, they all know. (laughs) And I said, I just did and none of them did. And he goes, what? And then he goes, in an auditorium, over 600 people that day, he says, how many of you know what this word means? And three hands shot up. (laughs) And he goes, oh my. Why won't you be understanding of something? Your dissatisfaction is that same way. The person sitting to your right, your left, the person sitting in front of you, the person sitting behind you, they're not dissatisfied at all about what you're dissatisfied about. They're not passionate at all about what you're passionate about. But then they're not designed to be. You are designed by God to fulfill your purpose. So find where your gift is. And it may be that through that dissatisfaction that you can come and say, Hey, listen, anybody can point out a problem. But begin to bring the solution out of the mix of what God has given you. God has prepared you for that. So begin to see your dissatisfaction from a positive angle that says, Hey, I get the opportunity of meeting a need in the kingdom of God. Wow, that's a lot of fun. Okay, so listen to your heart. Also, the next step. Listen to the counsel of others. Now, I want to put a disclaimer here. I don't want you to just listen to anybody's counsel. I want you to listen to a godly person's counsel. I want you to think about the counsel from the standpoint of, is this person someone who is praying? Is this person someone who has uh, biblical knowledge and insight? Is this person someone 
who is actually aware of what God is doing in their life and using that in ministry. Because you want to pull those people around you and begin to hear from them. You know why? Because the problem is we cannot see what's unique in us. We're so used to us. It's sort of like my children, are, both my girls, are professional photographers. And if they do a family shoot, let, let's just say they do a family shoot, they get Matt and Alice and, and all their family, and they get them up here, and, and they take their picture. And, and they, my, my kids say this happens almost 100% of the time. They would come in, and they would look at the picture, and they would go, oh, isn't this a wonderful picture? Can't you just see Alice just jumping up and down? Oh, the kids look great. Oh, isn't that wonderful? But look at my smile. My smile wasn't as big as I wanted it. It's not as, it's not as bright. And, and, and Matt's sitting there going, Alice, you look great. But look. Look, if I'd have just had my head turned a little bit differently, that, that, that would have been, I would have looked so much better. You know, it's just, we look at ourselves and, and we don't see what others see. We see ourselves more in a negative light where we don't have the good looks. We don't have the, the good opportunity. We don't have the, the good abilities. We don't have all those. That's how we look at ourselves. But see, to be frankly honest, all we see of ourselves is when we're brushing our teeth and combing our hair. The rest of the day, we don't see us. Everybody else has to look at that or gets to look at that, depending on how you want to look at it. So here's what a counselor will do. The biblical counselor, the, the friend that's godly, is going to come in beside you and help you understand the unique areas God has in your life. You just see them as normal. You've lived with it for years and never seen it as a special gift from God. Some of you are able to just... <clears throat> matter of fact, I had a friend the other day that, that uh, sent a tweet out about a guy that he's a friend with and said he is so outgoing he will talk to anyone period I've heard him comment even at a funeral he'd talk to the dead person you know just he's not he just he just he just talks to everybody some of you struggle to say hi but did you know the person that struggles to say hi is just as gifted as the person who doesn't struggle with it at all. And the thing is, you've got to learn what is it that God is doing with me that will help promote the kingdom of God, that will help complete the church, that will help minister, that will help move. So we need to, we need to look at that. In Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22, it says, Without consultation... Plans are frustrated, but with many counselors, they succeed. You want to bring around you those counselors to help you see who you are. Now, you know what? The last thing I want us to look at is practice. And sometimes we especially think, I don't want to look bad. So I need to know going into this, am I going to succeed? You can't know that. Because you can plan, you can prepare, you can do everything right. And at the end of the day, are you going to succeed in it? I don't know. In 2015, in November, we were in the Philippines. And when we were in the Philippines, I know I, was, I was, had, had nine different events we did in, in nine days. It was an amazing time. But one of those days was a children's event that we were going to do. We were told by the pastor that there'd be over 200 children at this event. 
And so we planned and we prepared and we got stuff together and we got everything ready. But see, we weren't quite ready for it the way we would have envisioned it. We walked to the past or went to the pastor's house and his yard was the size of the pew area on this side of the church. Not talking about the front up here, not talking about the sound, but just that area. Had a little pavilion there, had a fishing boat there because we were right by the ocean. And there were over 200 kids packed into that area. And they told me it was my turn to do it. You know, all right, lead the kids. Teach them about Jesus. Let them have fun. You know, do it. And so I get started. It's absolute bedlam. It's not working. I mean, I can't get off of ground floor with this thing. It's terrible. You'd hate to know that you've got a pastor that failed that miserably. But you know what? There was a young guy that was a student at the seminary or at the Bible college, that was with us. And I looked at him and I said, can you take over? And he said, yes. And he walks to the front and it's like, ta-da, I am here. I have arrived. Let's get going. And it went, those kids went crazy. Everything went fantastic from that moment on. You know what? I love being around kids. It's absolutely wonderful. Give me four or five, it's fantastic. Give me 200, I don't know what in the world to do. So this, this November when we go to the Philippines, we're taking Patrick. <laughs> we're, 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 not going to, we're not going to mess around with me trying to do anything with that group. Okay, I'll go over there and wave at them, smile at them and everything. But you know what? That's the thing. In your understanding, you've got to be exposed to the things to find out, whoop, that's not me. Or wow, that is me. Every one of us are going to have different things. Why? Because there's so many different areas that God needs us to be involved in. We're all part of the body of Christ. So we need to sit there and say, okay, I'm willing to step out and practice. Okay, I'm feeling like God is calling me to be a teacher. Or I'm feeling like God is calling me to be something else. And, and you know, just find those opportunities. You can call us, talk with us, come visit with us, say, hey, I feel like this is what I need. We'll give you those opportunities. If you get in there and five or six weeks later you go, oh yeah, I found out this definitely is not where my gift is. That's okay. You've learned something about how God has gifted you. You may get in there and go five or six weeks going, oh, man, you mean I've been here this long? It's like a while ago somebody asked me, they said, Pastor, how long have you been in Hong Kong? Well, we've been here a little over ten months now. We're one week into our 11th month. I think that's right. It's hard to believe it's been that long. My wife and I were just talking about this the other day when we said, you know, tomorrow, or yesterday, when we said tomorrow is the last day of April and we're going, there's no way that can be. You know, my concern when I came here is, am I going to fit? And y'all may be still wondering that, but we're thinking it's going pretty well. We're enjoying it. God is, God is, we're having fun with it. But you know what? We would never know unless we move forward. Some of you, in your prayer walk, as you are learning from God, as you're hearing from Him, as you're getting that confirmed by your passions or your dissatisfactions, as you're having others that are around you counsel you, take the opportunity to practice and then use what God has given you to be a blessing to others. That's what your spiritual gift is all about. So that you can take that gift that you have and exercise it, whether it's service or teaching or, or motivation or leadership or whatever those areas are. 
so that you can have a part in the kingdom. You and I need to understand those gifts because they're important. Today, what part do you play? Do you know? Some of you do, some of you don't. But hopefully today as you leave, you'll have these steps that you can walk through so that in the weeks ahead, you will have the opportunity to say, this is what God's doing in my life. For some of you here this morning, you don't have a spiritual gift. Now, I'm not talking to anybody who's a believer in Jesus Christ when I say that. Because every believer in Jesus Christ has a spiritual gift. What I'm talking about is there are some of you here today that don't have a spiritual gift because you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll have people, they'll say, well, you know, I love God, but they've never really given God control of their life. Some people will say, I know about God. I know a lot about God. I even come to church regularly. But that doesn't mean you're a Christian. But when you give God control of your life, you let Him take charge, and you say, God, I want you to be in lead of my life then when He comes into your life, He gives you that spiritual gift. And so God's got two gifts He wants to give you. First, He wants to give you that don't know Jesus, the gift of eternal life in Him. The second thing, the gift of the Spirit in a special way, a grace gift that you can use. So this, this morning, would you give your heart, your life, your all to Jesus Christ? So this morning, as we, as we prepare for our invitation time, I want to ask those of you who don't know Jesus Christ, would you be willing to just come up and say, hey, I want to know who Jesus is. Last week, we had two people that prayed to receive Christ. We had seven people in our class Sunday night that shared that they want to join KIBC as members. And it may be that you want to join KIBC as a member. And you can come up and share that with us also. But for many of you today, would you just be in prayer saying, God, this, this is me. I'm opening up. I want to know what your gift in my life is and how to make that a part of the ministry of the body of Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your love, your guidance, and leadership in our life. We just ask you to walk with us, direct us, and keep us that our hearts, our minds, and our lives will be totally surrendered to you. In Jesus' name, amen.